Hello and welcome to the module Risk Assessment Principles. My name is Gurumurthy Ramachandran and I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences. By the end of this module, learners should be able to do the following. Describe how the severity of occupational hazards is expressed. Illustrate how hazard severity and exposure are combined to characterize risk. Identify strategies to assess worker exposure to potential hazards. Explain approaches to managing risk once it has been characterized. And finally, recognize uncertainties associated with risk management. Generally speaking, risk is the likelihood of injury, disease, or death. Going further along these lines, we can define environmental risk as the likelihood of injury, disease, or death resulting from human exposure to a potential environmental hazard. Risk can be quantified. One way in which risk can be quantified is as the product of the severity of the hazard and the probability of the hazard or the effect. In the case of chemical hazards, the severity of the hazard can be represented by its toxicity and the probability of the hazard is expressed as the exposure. We will talk more about both these concepts in greater detail later. There are three major components of risk assessment or steps in the risk assessment process. Hazard characterization, dose response evaluation, and human exposure evaluation. The rest of this module will discuss each of these steps in depth. Let us get started with the first step in risk assessment, namely hazard characterization. Hazard characterization is the subjective scientific evaluation of animal data, in vivo data, human data, and structure activity relationship data to produce a comprehensive judgment about the potential human health effects arising from exposure. We will discuss each of these different types of data in more detail soon. Hazard characterization is the critical first step in the risk assessment process, and it is always based on data. We will talk about what kinds of data just shortly. This step includes data relating to any and all the potential health endpoints, from irritation to cancer arising from exposure to the agent. The process can also include physiologically based pharmacokinetic model or PBPK models that are used for predicting the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of synthetic and natural chemical substances in humans and other animal species. Since the available data may often not be definitive and complete, the process involves a lot of expert judgment, typically involving toxicologists, epidemiologists, and other professionals. It may sometimes result in an agent receiving a cancer classification. That is, that a given substance is a known human carcinogen or a probable human carcinogen or not a human carcinogen, among other such examples. An LD50 or a lethal dose 50 is the most basic measure of toxicity or hazard. It simply describes the dose needed that will result in the death of 50% of a group of test animals. This number is useful in comparing the toxicity of chemicals. The more of a chemical that it takes to kill 50% of the animals, the less toxic it is. A relatively low number indicates that the chemical is more toxic than another because it takes less of the chemical to have a fatal effect. Thus, an LD50 of 1 milligram per kilogram of body weight is more toxic than an LD50 of 5 milligram per kilogram of body weight. Although an LD50 is a very gross measure of toxicity and doesn't help understand how the chemical is toxic or what effects might occur at low doses over a lifetime, it is useful as a means of comparison. This slide shows several chemicals with a wide range of LD50s and this list helps us compare the relative toxicities of very different chemicals. Of course, chemicals can have a wide range of effects on our health. 
depending on how the chemical will be used, many kinds of toxicity tests may be required. Since different chemicals cause different toxic effects, comparing the toxicity of one with another is hard. We could measure the amount of a chemical that causes kidney damage, for example, but not all chemicals will damage the kidney. We could say that nerve damage is observed when 10 grams of chemical A is administered and kidney damage is observed when 10 grams of chemical B is administered. However, this information does not tell us if A or B is more toxic because we do not know which damage is more critical or harmful. When we say highly toxic, it usually means that the LD50 is very low. As I mentioned before, the review of the available information is done by experts. The data sources are assessed for their quality and adequacy. For example, are they individual one-off studies or databases about toxicity? Given all the information, what does the weight of evidence suggest about the toxicity of the agent? How relevant is the information for human health? Will toxic effects in one setting occur in another setting? Some examples of hazard characterization are the OSHA or Occupational Safety and Health Administration preambles for health standards and supporting risk assessments, the NIOSH or National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health criteria documents, the ACGIH TLV or the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists Threshold Limit Values documentation and cancer classification, the IARC or the International Agency for Research on Cancer Reviews and Cancer Classifications, the ATSDR or the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry Toxicology Profiles, EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency Specific Chemical Reviews and Cancer Classification, and the EPA IRIS system or the Integrated Risk Information System Database. Hazard characterization data can come from human studies, animal toxicity studies, and other types of supporting studies. Human studies can be clinical or epidemiological studies. Clinical studies are rare and more common for non-cancer effects. In such studies, the health status of two or more groups of people whose exposures to some substances different and closely controlled in a clinical setting are compared. Epidemiology studies are the most definitive source of information but are not often available. Epidemiology is the science that describes the distribution of a disease or other adverse effects in a population and analyzes those factors that influence that distribution. Here, unlike a clinical study, larger populations are compared for their health status relative to exposure to a given hazard. While there is less stringent control of the groups of people, the advantage is a much larger group of people to study. Animal toxicity studies are based on the long-standing assumption that effects in humans can be inferred from effects in animals. Supporting data can come from studies looking at the pharmacokinetics, that is, the study of the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of chemical substances in the body. They can come from the mechanism of action or the understanding of the precise sequence of biological events that causes a particular adverse event. They can come from structure activity relationships, that is the relationship between the chemical structure of a molecule and its biological activity. And they can also come from in vitro studies that are studies of the effect of the hazard using tissue level or cellular level experiments. Epidemiology studies propose a hypothesis to test, for example, the association between a specific risk factor and a health effect. It uses statistical models to test its hypotheses. This approach will not prove the hypothesis. It can only fail to disprove it, that is, by rejecting the null hypothesis. It may be used in weight of evidence analysis 
that we'll discuss later on, and to generate new hypotheses, but doesn't show mechanism in the strict sense. Epidemiological studies might show that there is a link between exposure to an agent and a health effect, and therefore their relevance is clear, but it can be difficult to establish causality for a variety of reasons. And some of these reasons are human beings do not live in controlled environments, assessing past exposures can be difficult, there are often confounding exposures, many occupations involve mixed exposures, there is a long time between exposure and the manifestation of its effect, that is long latency period. Epidemiology finds associations but does not address causality. The objective then is to evaluate the strength of evidence for a specific compound with an eye on these major issues. Did the study have proper exposed and control groups? Are there studies with large sample sizes or multiple studies with a valid meta-analysis, that is a study of studies? Are there studies of adequate duration and a long duration of follow-up is preferred? Do the studies under review control for factors that may affect the relationship between exposure and disease, that is confounders? Is the hypothesis reasonable? That is, is there a valid cause for morbidity or illness? Was the determination of exposure and dose done in a scientifically defensible manner? Now we come to animal studies. There are three main areas of focus for animal studies. Endpoints are evaluated generally and for several organ systems. The endpoints are in terms of both structure and function including developmental endpoints for reproductive, nervous, immune, and cardiovascular systems. Life stages include exposure and outcome evaluations. Duration of exposure and outcomes are also evaluated. Animal studies can be divided into three kinds on the basis of study duration. Acute studies last 14 days. The goal of this is to provide a basis for identifying potential target organs and toxicities and to assist in setting doses for the 13-week exposure study. Subchronic studies last 13 weeks. In addition to obtaining toxicological data, the purpose of these studies is to determine the doses for each strain and species to be used in the two-year toxicology or carcinogenesis study. Chronic studies last for around two years. The purpose of these studies is to determine the toxicologic and or carcinogenic effects of long-term exposure on specific animals. The strengths and limitations of animal studies complement those of epidemiology. The exposure is clearly defined in animal studies. Confounding factors can be controlled, and so causality can be attributed to a specific agent. Number three, small risks can be investigated through high-dose testing. And finally, results are available in less than three years. Animal studies are always dogged by the question of whether the experimental results are relevant to humans. While the precise measurements afforded by bioassays can demonstrate causality, the question is relevance of these results to human beings. In all these studies, sufficient evidence generally means that positive results have been replicated in independent studies. There is a third type of study that focuses on the mechanism of action or mechanism of toxicity. Mechanistic studies seek to fill in the blanks between exposure and the occurrence of health effect. They seek to understand the sequence of events inside the body at the cellular and tissue levels that lead to biological changes that can be detected using bioassays or tests that can measure some biological entity or biomarker in the body. These changes are the precursors to the actual 
adverse health effects that eventually manifest themselves. Knowledge of these intermediate steps can provide information about relevance. For example, is the mechanism in experimental animals likely to be operating in human beings as well? Is the mechanistic evidence weak, moderate, or strong? Such knowledge allows epidemiologic and experimental studies to focus on target cells and tumor precursors. Hazard characterization ends with the subjective qualitative evaluation of the potential for human health risk if exposure occurs. It seeks to identify what will occur. It is not a dose response assessment which is typically handled separately and will be discussed next. One important issue is to understand how the evidence, that is data from various types of studies, are evaluated. There are two approaches, the strengths of evidence approach and the weight of evidence approach. The strength of evidence approach focuses on how strong are the positives. This approach considers the quality and quantity of the studies relating to the effects of a particular hazard as well as the consistency between the findings of these studies. On the other hand, the weight of evidence approach focuses on are there positives and negatives? What are the relative strengths of these studies? The weight of evidence is a phrase used to describe the type of consideration made in a situation where there is uncertainty and which is used to ascertain whether the evidence or information supporting one side of a cause or argument is greater than that supporting the other side. IARC, or the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and NTP, which is the National Toxicology Program, historically have used strength approaches. ACGIH, which is the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, and EPA, or the Environmental Protection Agency, tend to use weight-based approaches. Experts score their judgment of the evidence using the following categories. Sufficient or clear evidence, limited or mixed evidence, inadequate evidence in the studies, no data available, and no evidence of effect in any studies. The collective judgments are made on two aspects of the classification, animal and human data. Typically, genetic toxicology data is handled as a modifier based on the strength of the studies. This slide shows an example of how experts arrive at a cancer classification using both human and animal data or evidence. We can see that human data is weighted more in the final decision. Along the top row, we see that if human evidence is sufficient, then irrespective of the quality of animal study data, it is classified as a known human carcinogen. In the second row, if there is limited human evidence, then the agent is classified as a probable human carcinogen irrespective of the quality of the animal data. If there is sufficient or limited animal data, but inadequate human data or no data or no evidence, then it is classified as a possible human carcinogen. If there is no evidence from either type of study, then it is considered as not a human carcinogen. For the rest of the conditions, the substance is said to be not classifiable as a human carcinogen. Now we have finished discussing hazard characterization and are moving to dose response assessment. The goal here is to understand what level of dose causes what level of biological response. A key assumption in this process is that a toxic effect typically increases monotonically with increasing dose. That is, a positive increase in dose is accompanied by a positive increase in the level of response, the so-called dose response curve or function. However, as we shall see soon, even this assumption has been challenged. We start off by considering some hypothetical but typical data from a rodent study. The experiments were conducted at relatively high doses, mainly so that a response could be observed in a relatively short time period. But human beings normally encounter environmental doses that are far smaller. 
So how do we extrapolate the results of the rodent study conducted at high doses to humans at much lower doses? One simple solution is to draw a curve or a straight line through the data points that also passes through the origin. In other words, such a curve implicitly assumes that when the dose is zero, the response is also zero. As we can intuitively understand, we can draw a large number of curves that meet this condition. A second class of curves that we can draw through the same data points are those that do not pass through the origin but cross the horizontal x-axis at some point. Such a curve assumes that the dose needs to reach a minimum value or a threshold before a response manifests itself. This is called a threshold effect model. Typically, it is considered that carcinogens do not have a threshold while non-carcinogens may have a threshold. A third type of dose response is shown here where a very small dose causes a response that then reduces as the dose increases. But at much larger doses, a threshold effect model type curve is seen. This type of model has been proposed for substances that act as sensitizers or allergens where an initial small dose may cause an effect and this is needed for much larger doses to lead to a response. Thus, different families of dose response curves can be proposed for a given set of few data points. This graph shows a few more possibilities for dose response relationships we can see the linear threshold model where there is no response below a certain dose. We see the no threshold model that goes all the way down to zero dose and re zero response. We also see the false threshold model where there is a response at very low doses followed by an apparent threshold. But we can also see another hypothesized relationship where a substance at low doses is considered to have a beneficial health effect and has an adverse effect only at high doses. This phenomenon is called hormesis. For example, small amounts of alcohol consumption are associated with cardiovascular benefits, while at high levels of alcohol consumption, this benefit is lost, and indeed there are harmful effects. However, hormesis is a fairly controversial new concept, and we will not be considering hormesis in any further discussions in this module. For non-cancer causing agents, the standard approach to deriving an occupational exposure limit or OEL has been to use the animal or human data and apply several safety and uncertainty factors to the reference or threshold effect obtained from the study to arrive at an OEL that can be used in practice. These factors are used to account for uncertainties in the extrapolation of data from one set of conditions to another. And the next slide will show some of these extrapolations. There is a safety factor to account for our confidence in the results of the study. There is a factor to adjust for missing data or information. Absorption efficiency may differ in the animal species compared to humans. Finally, we have the volume of air breathed in by an average human worker in an eight-hour shift, which is 10 cubic meters. The reference level is usually in terms of mass, and when this is divided by the volume of air, we get units of concentration, that is, milligrams per cubic meter of air, which can be used as an occupational exposure limit. This slide shows the various extrapolations that need to be made with incomplete knowledge and hence the uncertainty factors corresponding to them. To extrapolate study findings from average humans to sensitive humans, we apply a correction factor of 10. That is, we reduce the OEL by a factor of 10. To extrapolate findings from animal data to humans, we apply a factor of 10 or a 3 depending on the animal. To extrapolate findings from a short-term study to long-term human exposures, we apply a factor of 10. Using a lowest observed adverse effects level, or LOAEL, -E 
to derive a no observed adverse effects level or NOEL, another factor of 10 is used. As mentioned earlier, missing or incomplete data results in another uncertainty factor of 10. Thus, each of these factors results in a reduction of the OEL by as much as an order of magnitude. Now we come to the third component or the third step in the risk assessment process that is exposure assessment. This is also very challenging for a variety of reasons. We will never measure everything everywhere. We cannot measure some things right now because of the cost and logistical difficulties of doing so. We are exposed to hundreds of chemicals in our life and we need to prioritize what to assess exposures for. Risk assessment is often done for assessing situations that may have happened in the past or may happen in the future, and we cannot measure scenarios if we are not present there. They happen elsewhere, they happen in the past, they will happen in the future. Exposures can be through the inhalation route. These workers who are doing drywall sanding may breathe in silica-laden dust. This worker can be exposed to components in engine oil through her skin, that is dermal exposure. This child could get exposed to chemical and biological organisms in the body by swimming through it and ingesting some of it. There are several ways in which exposure can be assessed. The most straightforward, although not easy, method is to monitor the exposure using air sampling devices in the case of inhalation exposures. In this picture you see a pump draws the contaminated air through the collection device such as a filter on which it is collected for further analysis. This approach can get expensive because of the need to measure a sufficiently large number of people to get a statistically valid sample and the cost of analytical methods. Another approach is to use mathematical exposure models to evaluate exposures by understanding the factors that cause exposure and understanding how these factors that are also known as determinants of exposure are quantitatively related to exposure. These models can be simple or complex as shown in these two example equations. The outputs of the models shown in the previous slides are the air concentrations in the environment where the human being is located. If we also know the time spent by the person and their breathing rate, we can calculate a potential dose in units of mass or milligrams. As I mentioned earlier, models can be simple or complex. The level of complexity of a model determines the cost of using it. In order to use a model, we need to know the input information for it, and gathering this information takes resources, both time and money. The more complex a model, the more types of inputs we will need to know, making it more costly to use. But typically, models are less expensive to use than conducting exposure monitoring and then analyzing the collected sample. Now let us talk about uncertainty and how it affects risk assessment and risk management. As we can probably guess, the conclusions regarding the acceptability of risks are equally affected by the quality of data for both exposure or dose and the toxicity or the exposure limit. One thing that is less obvious is that gathering high quality or low uncertainty data almost always lowers the level of assigned risk by, by reducing the likelihood of extreme but highly improbable scenarios. Finally, the greater the distance between the occupational exposure limit or OEL and the exposure, the greater is the tolerance for uncertainty. There are several types of uncertainties. Type 1 Random and statistical variation arises from random errors in direct measurement of some quantity. Type 2 is variability. Quantities can vary over time and space and can be represented by a probability distribution. And finally, type 3 is incomplete scientific or technical knowledge. 
type 1 and type 2 uncertainties can be represented by sampling statistics whereas type 3 uncertainty can be very large and in fact dominate the overall uncertainty. A quick example in estimating exposure will illustrate these uncertainties and their effects on the estimates. Let us consider a scenario where a chemical agent X has an occupational exposure limit of 1 milligram per cubic meter. A contaminant source is generating the chemical at a rate that varies between 35 and 65 milligrams per hour. However, the airflow or ventilation rate through this environment is unknown. And we can represent this large uncertainty by saying that the airflow can vary between a very low and a very high rate. And in this case, this is done by looking at published airflow rates in rooms and choosing the minimum and maximum rates seen in this literature review. A simple model predicts exposure as the ratio of the generation and ventilation rates, or G divided by Q. A simple analysis can then consider worst and best case scenarios only. A worst case scenario, that is one that leads to the highest exposure, corresponds to the situation where G is the highest and Q is the lowest. And conversely, a best case scenario or lowest exposure is when G is lowest and Q is highest. So we arrive at an exposure range that could be between 0 0.065 and 1.8 milligrams per cubic meter. As we see here, the uncertainty in our estimate is so great that the exposures could be below or above the exposure limit and we cannot arrive at a useful assessment of exposure that can lead to exposure management and risk management recommendations. We can use a more sophisticated approach to modeling where instead of assessing best and worst case scenarios we conduct what is called as Monte Carlo analysis that assesses all the scenarios that are possible according to the probability of their occurrence. Here G is assumed to be a normal distribution with 35 and 65 milligrams per hour being points near the tails of the distribution and the values in the middle are more likely. Q is assumed to have a uniform distribution between 36 and 540 that is, all values in this range are equally likely. The uncertainty in G is due to the natural variability in the generation rate. And therefore, we can posit a more likely value represented by the peak in the middle of the normal distribution. The uncertainty in Q is because of a lack of knowledge and is therefore very wide. And all values are equally likely, reflecting our ignorance. This leads to an exposure estimate that ranges between 0 0.09 to 0 0.82 is more precise than the simpler approach we discussed earlier. As we can see now, this more sophisticated approach leads to the conclusion that the exposure estimate with its uncertainty is unequivocally below the exposure limit. If instead of modeling, we obtained five monitoring samples and used these to estimate the exposure, then we see that all of the five samples are below the occupational exposure limit. However, a standard statistical analysis that estimates the 95th percentile of the exposure estimate shows that it is greater than the exposure limit. The upper tolerance limit, or UTL, which is the upper end of the error bar around the estimate of the 95th percentile is around 16 milligrams per cubic meter. This graph now compares the results from the three approaches. The monitoring approach that uses only five data points actually leads to an estimate with much greater uncertainty than either of the models. This uncertainty is due to the small sample size and is a consequence of sampling statistics. The simple model with the best and worst case estimates 
also has wide uncertainty intervals because it is not considering the full distribution of all possible scenarios according to the likelihood of their occurrence and instead uses two very unlikely scenarios the best and worst situations possible. Next we will study an example of how risk assessment is carried out. In the example we consider a compound X for which inhalation exposure exists in the workplace. An ACGIH TLV exists but now there is new and significant toxicity data on the compound. New experiments with rats indicates that maternal rat exposure leads to the rat pups having malformed ribs. The lowest observed effect level or LOL is equal to 10 milligram per kilogram of body weight per day of maternal dose. In other words, an adverse effect is seen in the offspring of the rat mothers when the mothers have a dose of 10 milligram per kilogram of body weight per day. And the current ACGIH threshold limit value is equal to 25 parts per million, time weighted average. We can use these data to derive a new occupational exposure limit. Let us assume that these data can be extrapolated from rats to humans. For a 65 kilogram worker, the dose rate of 10 milligram per kilogram per day results in a daily dose of 10 milligram per kilogram per day times 65 kilogram worker equals 650 milligrams per day. Assuming a breathing rate of 10 cubic meters of air per day, we can divide the 650 milligrams per day by 10 cubic meters per day to get an estimated lowest observed effects level of 65 milligrams per cubic meter for the worker. Since these data came from a rat study, we need to apply some safety and uncertainty factors to arrive at a working occupational exposure limit. The Lowell or the lowest observed effect level divided by the safety factor is what we will call our working exposure limit. Assuming that we only need to account for the rat to human extrapolation, the Lowell can be divided by a safety factor of 10 and so we divide 65 by 10 to obtain 6.5 milligram per cubic meter which corresponds to concentration of 1.3 parts per million. Of course this is much lower than the current ACGI threshold limit value of 25 parts per million. What if there are other uncertainties that need to be accounted for? We could apply a safety factor of 100 or 1000 and in these cases the working occupational exposure limits will be even lower. The new application for the compound X has never been monitored and an inhalation model now predicts that a worker's 8 hour time weighted average exposure has a mean of 2 parts per million and a 95th percentile of 10 parts per million. The risk assessor in this instance can conclude that based on the data in hand a possibility exists that the exposure could exceed a reasonably established exposure limit. That is compound X could represent a significant reproductive risk to female workers. In other words while the exposure is less than the current TLV of 25 parts per million, it is greater than the new working exposure limit of 1.3 part per million derived using the new data. Now if this conclusion is satisfactory to the client, that is his or her needs are met, then no further work is needed. If however this conclusion is not satisfactory, then the risk assessor should discuss options to reduce the uncertainty and the concomitant conservatism that went with it. Some of the additional data needed to refine the risk assessment are 
additional toxicity data that is of course very time consuming to obtain. The risk assessor could also obtain additional exposure data and these can be obtained through monitoring of a simulation or by refining the models or by analyzing monitoring data from other compounds in a similar application. At this point, as a prelude to discussing risk management, we can review the public health problem solving paradigm. The first three bullets define the problem, measure its magnitude, and understand key determinants comprise risk assessment as we have been discussing it till now in this module. After risk has been assessed, we are able to develop intervention and prevention approaches, determine policy and priorities, and implement and evaluate the management or intervention. These three steps comprise risk management. Risk assessment, risk management, and traditional industrial hygiene practice are very similar. If we look at the ingredients of occupational or industrial hygiene, anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control of workplace hazards, the first three fall squarely in the realm of risk assessment and control is clearly a risk management activity. The next set of slides will emphasize this idea of similarity between occupational hygiene and risk assessment and management and how in occupational hygiene risk assessment can seamlessly move into risk management. This slide shows the AIHA or American Industrial Hygiene Association's exposure assessment framework. The process starts with a basic characterization of the workplace area that we are focusing on. This step involves gaining an understanding of the processes, chemicals used, and tasks performed in that part of the workplace. This helps in classifying workers on the basis of their tasks or jobs and focuses the exposure assessment on a particular group of workers at a time. Exposure is then assessed for this group of workers called a similarly exposed group or SEG. This is done by estimating the 95th percentile of the exposure distribution, either through monitoring or modeling. The assessed exposure, that is the 95th percentile, is then compared with an occupational exposure limit that was derived during hazard characterization for that chemical to see if the exposure is acceptable that is the 95th percentile is below the OEL unacceptable the 95th percentile is above the OEL or uncertain that is we need to gather more information since the decision is based on the 95th percentile it is called the decision statistic this chart shows the AIHA decision category definitions. If the 95th percentile is less than 1% of the occupational exposure limit or OEL, we call it category zero. If the 95th percentile is between one to 10% of the OEL, it is a category one. If it is between 10 to 50% of the OEL, it is a category two. If it is between 50 to 100% of the OEL, it is category three. If the 95th percentile exceeds the OEL, then it is a category four exposure. We can also think of a situation where the 95th percentile is much, much greater than the OEL, in which case we can call it a category five exposure. This is the exposure assessment part. The second column in this table shows the various types of actions that can be taken by the hygienist. The actions range from nothing at all for category zero, to general hazard communication if it's a category one exposure, chemical specific hazard communication for category two, detailed exposure surveillance or medical surveillance and evaluation of work practices for category three, the use of respirators and engineering controls and work practice controls for category four, and finally immediate engineering controls or process shutdown and validated respirator selection for category 5. Thus the results of exposure assessment lead directly and transparently to risk or exposure management measures.
Let us review once again how practical risk management occurs. We use qualitative modeling and or monitoring information to assess exposures. All the available information is used to arrive at the decision statistic. This is called integrated exposure assessment and is a part of integrated risk assessment. In integrated risk assessment, the decision chart on the right hand side shows the probability of the 95th percentile or decision statistic being located in one of the AIJ exposure categories. This chart is based on the evaluation of qualitative and modeling information alone. Then we arrive at a decision chart solely based on monitoring data alone. Finally, we integrate the conclusions from the modeling and monitoring to arrive at an integrated decision that uses all the available information. In this example, we see that there is an 86.5% probability that the decision statistic, which is the 95th percentile, is in category 2. While both the qualitative slash modeling and monitoring data indicated that category 2 was indeed most likely, the integrated assessment provided the highest confidence in that decision. This integrated risk assessment leads to control recommendations. In this case, a Category 2 assessment leads us to the control recommendation that chemical-specific hazard communication is warranted in this situation. To summarize this module, hazard characterization, dose response evaluation, and exposure assessment are the three components of risk assessment. Hazard is characterized using animal, in vivo, human health effect studies, and mechanistic data. Several uncertainty factors are needed to extrapolate the dose-response relationship obtained from a study to typical environmental exposure levels encountered by human beings. Exposure assessment can be carried out using physical measurements as well as mathematical modeling. And finally, integrated risk assessment leads to appropriate risk management measures. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences of the National Institute of Health under award number R25ES023595. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health.